Many YouTube icons come with an expiration date. While some walk away from a fan base perpetually starving for a comeback upload, others leave no legacy behind at all besides their languishing fame, being looked upon as little more than a relic of the past. For many people, that's what Boogie2988 is, an old fad like Chocolate Rain that simply doesn't belong in this day and age. However, those who are unfortunate enough to know that he never left tend to know him as a pathological liar, manipulator, and overall someone deserving of criticism and mockery. From pointing a gun at Frank Hassel's face, to losing hundreds of thousands on cryptocurrency, Boogie's glory days are long gone, and his attempts to return aren't working. He's now been reduced to a lol cow, and one that is slowly losing interest even amongst his haters. This is the full lore of Boogie2988. Boogie, real name Stephen Jason Williams, was born in 1974 in St. Paul, Virginia, to a coal miner father and a school teacher mother, as well as two siblings. As he's often described, his childhood wasn't easy. Because of the stress that comes from being a coal miner, his father was an alcoholic, which negatively affected the rest of the family in a myriad of ways. At the peak of his drinking problems, he was downing up to 30 beers in one single day, an extreme that scarred Boogie to the point that he would never drink alcohol even as an adult. To top it all off, Boogie also claims his mother and sister were very mentally ill, making for an intensely toxic home environment involving lots of arguing and constant screaming, which he remembers as devolving into outright abuse coming from his mother. To make matters worse, Stephen tended to have a lot of health problems, though initially not serious and the kind of thing people usually shrug off or take over-the-counter pills for, like the flu or allergies. However, these illnesses were chronic for him, causing him to stay home from school a lot. As you might expect, being inside all the time led to a habit that would haunt him for the rest of his life, overeating. Before he was even in high school, he had already dealt with a serious weight problem due to stress eating. It was also during this time he developed an interest in things like comic books, video games, and Dungeons and Dragons, which, though harmless on their own, certainly didn't help him to go outside more often. Meanwhile, his father's constant smoking and drinking, when paired with their increasingly stressful domestic situation and his exhausting job, was taking its toll on his health. Eventually, he suffered from a major stroke, one that left him basically immobile and unable to function. He was no longer able to hear and struggled a lot with communicating after he developed a stutter as a consequence of the stroke. Now, with just one parent to take care of him and his siblings, Boogie's support system was even smaller, and his binge eating severely worsened. It's tough enough to be raised by a single parent, but as his dad moved out of the picture, his mom's abusive behavior took center stage. Usually, in the absence of a healthy and nurturing home life, people seek refuge in their peers and community, but this wasn't an option for Boogie either since his classmates did little besides mock him for his weight and appearance. Things were dire, and Boogie's future prospects looked very dark at this point in his life. But thankfully, during high school, he was given an opportunity that would turn things around. Upward Bound is a federally funded pre-college program designed to give high school students a better opportunity at attending a university, targeted specifically at those in low-income or rural areas who may be less likely to seriously consider higher education. While participating in this program, he met others in similar situations to him who shared his interest in nerd culture. He bought bonded with a girl on the program over playing video games, which marked a silver lining on the dark cloud that had been his childhood up until this point. By the end of high school, he had friends and even a girlfriend, and upon graduating, he enrolled in the same college as her, the University of Virginia. But shortly thereafter, they would break up. And since this was his first serious relationship and one of his few sources of happiness, it hit him hard, sending him deep into a depression which affected his academic performance. His grades were so bad that he had to drop out, and once again, he was directionless. But thankfully, his brother took pity on him after he noticed how much he was struggling and decided to offer him an opportunity to move away and start from scratch. Boogie took him up on that offer, not that he had many alternatives to pick from. While in Arkansas with his brother, his life once again saw improvement. More nerds in the area meant making friends wasn't going to be difficult. Soon, he was participating in Dungeons and & Dragons and Magic the Gathering sessions with his new social circle. On top of that, he learned how to code in HTML, which led to him working as a freelance web designer. One of the downsides of this was that he'd have to take clients he wasn't particularly excited about, such as CD Not Safe for Work websites, but then again, it was still better than unemployment. So I started using what I learned to start coding for the web, and I started doing web design, which was really fun, even though sometimes I ended up with clients that I didn't like working for who did kind of dirty stuff. He was now a young man with a stable income and a healthy social life. However, he was still getting sick and he was depressed very often. He never properly dealt with his childhood trauma and because of that, he also never stopped binge eating and the resulting weight gain worsened his other issues. At around this time, his father passed away from cancer and his mother broke her leg, a combination of events that condemned Stephen to a period of chronic depression that lasted a total of seven years. During this time, he rarely left his house and was, for all intents and purposes, a neat, not in education, employment, or training. As his 
motivation to work dwindled, the coding market became more and more competitive, causing his source of income to dry up quickly, a fate that was soon after met by his savings. Also, due to not leaving the house, his social life stopped existing. After all that he'd been through, he found himself back at square one, with the only significant change being that he was significantly more heavy. At his heaviest, he was just shy of 600 pounds. While his roommate financially supported him out of pure pity, YouTube was debuting as a video sharing platform. This early on, it was still mostly populated by home videos and vlogs, with the occasional viral video peppered throughout. While it was rudimentary, it was more than enough to pique his attention, and soon, he started posting content of his own. 16 years ago, in the ancient times of ye old 2006, the first video was uploaded to the Boogie2988 channel. It was a simple, short clip of a 31-year-old Boogie playing D&D. The videos kept coming, and because he appeared in them, his appearance itself would become a topic of conversation in the comments section. Since at this point, he was used to people making fun of him for his weight, he made videos playing into the joke, such as, Fat Guy Eats McDonald's French Fries. This is damn food, I shouldn't eat so much of it. No. Shouldn't be eating at McDonald's, but I am it. Eventually, one of these videos saw a surprising amount of success, especially for early YouTube standards. The aptly titled The Incredible Bulk had Boogie ripping his shirt off, showcasing his M1 Abrams frame. Overall, people were very sympathetic towards him, as he embraced the mockery of his weight and seemed to be a kind and down-to-earth guy. But even at this stage, Steven's intention was not just having fun. He wanted to build a following online. Since back then the term YouTuber didn't exist and the thought of building a brand out of your personality was ludicrous and far-fetched, Boogie uploaded many different kinds of videos videos to try and get some views, such as this hypnosis video which was seen over 5 million times. For the first few years of his channel's existence, he slowly built a community, with series such as Rambling About Nothing, where the only purpose was to engage with the viewer. I imagine the gathering plane chase. Um, the people are really excited about it. We've been watching the Zendikar spoilers. In 2009, his channel hit 3,000 subscribers, which, once again at the time, was a respectable amount. Soon after, however, he uploaded a video explaining the absence of uploads, where he reveals his mother had died. But, unlike his previous bouts of complete inactivity due to some kind of tragedy in his personal life, Boogie came back with a vengeance and began playing a character. Francis, the living and breathing, though struggling to do so, embodiments of the basement-dwelling gamer stereotype, complete with Mountain Dew stains all over his shirt. In early 2010, Francis took a prominent role in Boogie's channel, partly for comedic purposes and partly because Boogie enjoyed trolling those who were unfamiliar with his content into thinking Francis was a real person. Eventually, a Francis video was featured on Ray William Johnson's Equals 3, which was the early 2010's equivalent of having Moist Critical react to your video. Essentially, it meant you either were, or soon will be, really, really popular. The video that Ray showed was titled, Francis Gets His Warcraft Account Hacked, and honestly, it's pretty tame compared to a lot of the stuff we see nowadays. Regardless, it was entertaining enough that nowadays it stands at a whopping 5 million views. This sets a precedent for Boogie, and in the following years, the Francis character would be the channel's bread and butter. The channel grew tremendously, to which Francis reacted. Yeah, it's been a pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting day, I guess. The channel surpassed 13,000 subscribers, and a few other classic Francis videos also went viral, such as Fat Guy Destroys Xbox. However, despite how central Francis became to the channel, Boogie continued to also appear as himself because he genuinely enjoyed interacting with viewers, regardless of how out of context it seemed alongside the comedy videos. While he did try a few other characters out, such as redneck stereotype Jesse, Francis retained his position at the top of the hierarchy. By the end of 2010, Boogie had 40,000 subscribers and had amassed 10 million views. In 2011, Boogie did a series of Let's Plays of Minecraft as Francis to capitalize on the growing gaming trend on YouTube, which at the time was at its very beginning. But along with these innovations, Boogie continued to post the tried and true format of Francis freaking out, such as, Where's my Mountain Dew? Do you see my glass? I'm raining in here, and I don't have any Mountain Dew! Wait, I, I, I saw some Mountain Lightning earlier. Where, where did you hide the Mountain Dew? With the extreme success of his channel becoming profitable as YouTube's ad revenue mechanisms became more functional, Boogie moved out of the apartment he was living in and into a house with his girlfriend, who helped him record the videos and even quit her job to help him out with them. Part of the reason that it was so easy to play Francis as much as he did was because Boogie was indeed very passionate about things like gaming news and internet culture. All he had to do was play up the fits of rage while he spoke his mind, and he was consistently met with hundreds of thousands of views and decent money to go with. After successful
successfully proposing to his girlfriend and opening a gaming channel called Boogie Plays Games, he hit the milestone of 100,000 subscribers. It's also around this time Google Plus integration was implemented, which forced people to use their real name to comment on videos and led to a general uproar on the platform, with Francis pitching in his two cents. This is not better, this is worse! How did they make it worse? I didn't think there was anything worse! In the Google comment section! But since this was a more serious topic for him that he felt passionate about, Boogie also spoke on it out of character, and soon after, he was once again featured on Equals 3. So recently, YouTube changed their comment system where now you have to sign into your Google Plus account before you can actually comment. Now, personally, I don't really care. I don't read comments that often, and frankly, it's just YouTube. Who gives a shit? But I've noticed people freaking out, like, I gotta sign into Google Plus! What is this, Nazi Germany? But this guy Francis has this rant about the topic that's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. By the end of 2013, he got married to his girlfriend, he had a better camera, and had grown a proper fan base of 1 million subscribers. In early 2014, he started appearing on TV shows and commercials, which marked the peak of Boogie's career. I had a guy tell me, you're too fat to be on the internet yourself now. He was now officially a mainstream YouTuber, not just a viral gag based on Francis. He had a genuine fan base, a real community. A lot of people watched him because they genuinely liked him and considered him a kind, level-headed person with reasonable opinions. This persisted for years, with him receiving acclaim from every YouTuber under the sun, and many looking to him to weigh in on some of the biggest dramas from 2014 to 2017 with his opinion, an opinion that, at the time, people did value. So let's start by talking about what happened to Felix. I think everybody knows what happened to PewDiePie. PewDiePie made some very tasteless jokes, jokes that I did not personally find all that funny. He would also talk about more serious issues, like when Matthew Santoro posted a video detailing physical abuse he suffered in a relationship. The fans put two and two together and figured he was talking about Nicole Arbor, who was also widely hated on the YouTube platform at the time. Boogie posted a video expressing his sympathies for Matthew and also detailed abuse he claimed to have suffered. My sister got taken out of her home because of the abuse she received. She was, I think, 13 or 14. Through the Francis character, Boogie was funny. Through his more personal videos, he was seen as thoughtful, introspective, and a voice of reason amidst all the madness of 2016 YouTube drama. He was someone many looked to for a good take on unfolding situations. But as time passed, many began to feel as though this reasonable demeanor was a facade for someone with an extreme inability to take any criticism or stand up for any ideal. Thus begins the fall of Boogie2988. At this point in time, Boogie was the Mr. Rogers of YouTube, and antagonizing him was so unthinkable that Low Tier God made a video doing just that for almost two minutes straight, precisely to try and be controversial. As anti-fat phobia movements cropped up, his stature once again became a topic of discussion, and after a long time of just accepting it as a fact of life, Boogie spoke publicly about how he realized his obesity was actually a product of his mental issues not being properly dealt with, and that he wanted to improve by getting a gastric bypass surgery to lose weight. After the midpoint of the 2010s, anti-SJW channels in the skeptic community were at their peak of relevance, and their spats with feminists and other groups were becoming increasingly publicized in conventional media. One of these feminists was Anita Sarkeesian, one of the main focuses of the online discussions for her belief that video games somehow encouraged sexual violence. Though people online hated her, she had enough mainstream support to get herself a panel at VidCon. Another content creator on that same panel was Boogie, who was still seen as a good guy. During said panel, Sargon of Akkad and other skeptics decided to attend, sitting in the front row. Of course, conflict erupted when Anita noticed them, and it would soon become one of the biggest dramas of the year. Boogie, I think we all know, is one of the nicest guys who there is on the entire of the website. There's not really a guy nicer than him. This perspective was echoed across many videos from skeptic and commentary channels alike. Boogie himself eventually spoke on what happened, revealing he was extremely nervous during the panel, and that after his closing statement, which was pretty mild overall and tried to minimize the static in the air, Anita came up to him and began berating him for saying his piece when she didn't have an opportunity to respond. This led audiences to criticize Anita, saying that she was an awful human being who had been mean to Boogie. Boogie then tried once again to de-escalate by saying that, though initially confrontation she ended up having a reasonable conversation with him behind the scenes, and they hashed things out respectfully. However, this attempt by him failed, as people noticed how uneasy he was while talking about it, and began claiming that he was cowering away from being completely honest about the situation. This exposed an issue that would later become much more glaring, Boogie's fence-sitting. Following the fallout of the Anita situation, Boogie's attempts at being a centrist who called out both sides was becoming more and more transparent, and people were seeing that he was interested exclusively in appearing to be the moderate good guy. Whenever he spoke about 
about it, it was to say saccharine truisms about how making generalizations is bad instead of addressing any element of the controversy directly. I get not talking about political things as to protect your brand, but why pitch in to say basically nothing? Or even worse, to say things you immediately contradict. Around this time, Boogie gets doxxed for the first time, which only goes to show what being in a one mile radius of any political community gets you, even if you try your hardest to offend no one. Another example of his fence sitting was a video he made about YouTuber Matthew Santoro plagiarizing lists from other websites, which he immediately took down when he noticed it wasn't having a good reception. On one hand, it's admirable to take a video down if you truly no longer stand by it. However, it seemed more that he was doing this to maintain his PR, instead of, you know, actually changing his mind on the topic. This is just one of many, many examples of Boogie doing this. More recently, Boogie said that people who purposely misgender others should get hit with a misdemeanor charge and even possibly jail time if it evolves into hate speech. Regardless of your opinion on this, after the tweet was met with negative responses, he pivoted to talking about how clips of his live stream were being taken out of context. As the negative reactions continued, he slowly buckled to public pressure, saying no one should go to jail because of the things they said and he just had a bad take. Another example of him firing off without thinking twice beforehand was when he was trying to handle the Vox media scandal between Carlos Maza and Steven Crowder. Though it began with a tweet asking for examples of people who were hurt by demonetization, it quickly detoured into him deriding both Steven Crowder and Vox in a really haphazard way, which once again, and both sides disapproved of. I don't know how he doesn't notice that doing this doesn't actually work and just makes everyone even more sick of his shtick. I'm not sure if it's some kind of pathological compulsion or if he thinks this is a smart strategy, but it consistently concludes in him getting harangued by everyone online. As a means of countering this narrative, he attempted to embrace it with pride, saying that he wasn't a fence sitter, but he was a reasonable moderate. While this approach did immediately save his credibility in the eyes of his audience, it didn't prevent users of subreddits, forums, and other sites dedicated to documenting erratic behavior from noticing it all and keeping tabs. What's crazy is that in the video where he talks about being a fence sitter, he outright admits that he doesn't care about many of the issues that he speaks on, which makes it all the more perplexing that he's still willing to. However grating it was to see, being a fence sitter was far from Boogie's only issue. Just as Boogie's image as the voice of reason began to fall apart, so did his marriage. In late December 2017, shortly after he got his gastric bypass surgery, he uploaded a video titled, It's True, Wife and I Are Getting a Divorce, Here's What's Next for Us, where he goes into detail about how it went down. Based on the information given by Boogie in this video and other instances where he spoke out, it was an amicable separation, so much so that despite it already being in their plans, his wife waited until he fully recovered from the surgery. But things certainly weren't as friendly as they were made out to seem. Later on, Boogie himself admitted that their divorce agreement included a non-disparage clause that he asked for, presumably to prevent her from saying negative things about him in a public space, which could damage his reputation. Now, in fairness, relationships are often messy and emotions can come over reason for those involved. It's possible this was a reasonable cautionary measure to prevent any unnecessary reveal of information that isn't necessarily career-ending, but maybe embarrassing if it were out there. But on the other hand, considering she was barely even a public figure, it made many question why the contract was needed at all. Immediately after after his divorce, he began dating a sugar baby. If you don't know what that is, it's when a man, usually a wealthy one, offers to date a woman from lower economic rungs and showers her with gifts and whatnot in exchange for dinners and sex. Later on, he denied that this was the case and tried to beat around the facts that he did this, claiming their relationship was organic and totally not a sugar baby situation. We know these to be lies because there are images of his profile on Seeking.com, a website dedicated to sugar babies and their sugar daddies, respectively. Eventually, he did come clean through an alt account to of his on his own subreddit, about half a year after the divorce had been filed, the person he was dating, Lucy Fox, came out with a video called The Truth, which was promptly shared on Boogie's subreddit, and though the original is no longer up, mirrors of it are pretty easy to find. In it, she claims that Boogie was verbally abusive to her whenever she tried to be independent in any way. Besides that, apparently Boogie didn't even hold up his end of the arrangement. Not only was he failing to pay her for her services, he was keeping her from doing any kind of work, though it seems this wasn't out of jealousy, but because he wanted a caretaker around him at all times, so he could keep complaining about his life and victimizing himself to her. When this information became public, Boogie went on drama alert to defend himself, and since him and Keem were good buds at the time, Boogie had an easy time controlling the narrative about what happened and claiming that Lucy was his girlfriend and a gold digger, as opposed to being an unpaid sugar baby. He went pretty much unchecked by Keemstar, who tried to take a more neutral approach. But thankfully, at this point, people were already realizing that Boogie was the definition of an unreliable narrator. She, you know. she said the only way she can make money is if she's at home doing her cam girl stuff right um, and that you wouldn't like let her leave the house is, is that true 
but she didn't live here. Like uh, she lived, she lives at home where she has her own home. But Boogie pretending to not have hired a sugar baby is extremely lightweight compared to his other offenses in the cap department. What other offenses you might ask? Well, given that Boogie lied about this, people began digging through his more serious stories to try and find what else he may be lying about. Given he had always been very vocal about his rough childhood, some began comparing his multiple accounts of the abuse he had suffered at the hands of his parents. We can start with his mother. Despite occasionally praising her as a strong single woman who raised three children, and took care of her invalid husband. In a Reddit comment, he says the following, I've never really gone into detail. Both my father and my mother were sexual abusers who were both sexually abusive to me, along with one other family member who's still alive, so I don't feel comfortable calling them out directly. So I'll wait until one of us are dead. I've discussed it mostly on live stream and only a little bit in videos. Sorry that I'm not comfortable going into further details. Later on, while streaming, he specifies that this sexual abuse meant molestation, but not rape. How do I respond? My mother never raped me. My mother did molest me. Um, she never, like, forced me to have sex with her, but she didn't molest me. It's a simple thing. I don't know why people are like that, what the heck, heh heh heh. And another, he claims his dad did rape him. In this tweet, he also claims to have been raped as a kid, and notwithstanding, claims that some good came of it, whatever the hell that means. Then, in another tweet, he reiterates that he had indeed been raped, and that he'd forgiven his rapist, which, if we're to follow the things he said so far, would be his dad, since he claimed in a tweet that his mother had never raped him. He goes as far as saying that his sister was molested by their dad, followed by the claim that his sister was gang raped in foster care. However, in a clip of his stream, he specifically says that his parents, plural, had raped him. In another of his Reddit essays, he follows the claims that he'd been raped with stories about how his mother stabbed him, his sister was almost beaten to death, his dad punching him, among other things. It's strange because, while sometimes he says things that range from suggesting to outright affirming that being raped was a common occurrence for him during his childhood, in other instances he claims it was just once. Under normal circumstances, we don't have any reason to doubt or excessively scrutinize stories of of this caliber. But at this point, Boogie was raising a few eyebrows with his increasingly extreme retellings. Eventually, a more complete and precise statement of the nature of his abuse was made to Reddit. I was molested by an older sibling, female at a young age. I remember very little of it, but enough to know that this wasn't just further stuff related to my Munchausen syndrome that my mother was famous for. Certainly, inappropriate contact was made between me and my older sister several times when I was three to four. Beyond that, my mother insisted something happened with another family member. I have no personal recollection of that, so I've always presumed that my mother was lying. But as I get older and more evidence rises to the top, the more I believe there is truth in it. What's even more complicated is that my relationship with my mother was certainly inappropriate and those details I will take to my grave. His sister, who is on Twitter, denied that this took place, while Boogie doubled down on saying that she raped him. Now, keep in mind, before you doubt these claims, it's not uncommon for victims of abuse to be confused about what exactly they suffered since the memories are so traumatic. But to misremember and misspeak as extensively as Boogie did led many to believe that he brought his abuse up as a way to garner sympathy whenever he felt the need for validation. Some thought he was changing his story when it felt more convenient to get more sympathy. Now, I would never go out and say that he lied about being abused in his childhood. For all of that to be lies would be genuinely reality-breaking. But there's a reason why many questioned his reliability as a narrator. In this, and many other cases, he couldn't get his story straight. This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to his documented contradictions or barrage of backtracks and word redefinitions. Remember a story about how he used to do web design for CD websites? Well, that's what is typically called a mass Massive euphemism. The truth of the matter is, Boogie ran porn sites, and not just in the distant past, but well into the late 2000s, when he'd already begun doing YouTube. In these sites, Evil Squared and CFPorn.com to name a couple, Boogie advertised for all kinds of adult content. He also used his online space to give his thoughts on things, as he would later do in his vlogs. One recurring theme was nothing other than his fleshlights, and I quote, I think personally my fleshlight is a bit better than being with a woman in some ways. No offense, I figured I'd list the reasons. One, it's tighter. 2. It sucks without complaining. 3. It swallows at least as deep as it can go. 4. When you're done, you can lock it in a dark place and it can't complain. 5. No need to reciprocate, but ultimately, I just flat out think it feels different, and in some ways better, than the real thing. Honestly, there's nothing like it. It's like the first time you pop Mary Lou's cherry at 18, or sinking it into your girl's butt for the first time. Not too tight, but oh so right. For your safety and mental health, no image will be attached of the thing he's talking about, but rest assured, it's about as graceful as you can imagine. Another gem from Evil Squared is this anime villain tier self-description from Boogie. The fact that I'm crazy is no stranger to the good staff at Evil Squared, nor is it a strange concept to anyone that reads this site or has viewed my videos. I am, for all intents and purposes, batch crazy. The past week or so has been different for me. This next week will be doubly so. Out into the real world, 
looking for real work at a real workplace. Hopefully landing a job this week. I'm excited. At the same time, these normal activities remind me exactly how insane I am. I wonder if the people interviewing me know what's going on under the surface. While I'm applying for a job, entering your data, or taking your orders, or speaking to your customers, do you know that I, during the previous weekend, we all got together and smoked weed, drank, and f***ed? Does she know how many orgies I've been to? Or arranged? Does she know how many girls I've watched f***? Or f*** myself? Does she know that I'm a monster? Does she know that I have internet sites that are so disorienting that it would make Satan blush? Does she know that I film more sex than she's likely to have had? On YouTube, Boogie was wholesome and reserved. Now, a lot of people are different behind the scenes than they are in their YouTube videos, and I wouldn't blame them. But it's hard to even believe that this is the same person as the one in the YouTube videos. Boogie2988 really wasn't him. It's now 2018, and while he's past his peak, Boogie still has some footing in the YouTube community. But it's at this time that money became a big talking point across his various platforms. Along with a few other sob stories at the time, Boogie often mentioned his financial situation with an air of despair or concern. For example, in this tweet, he acts as if the money that he'll be earning in the next year will be his entire savings since, as he prophesizes, his career is soon to be over and he'll go back to working retail. And this would be a very scary prospect, but it doesn't really add up. Mind you, at this point, he's been successful on YouTube for a decade and has over 4 million subscribers and owns his own home. He may have some more savings if not for his Funko Pop video game and toy collection, but I digress. In his many videos centered around promoting his Patreon, he says the donations are contributing towards his family's peace of mind. Again, I'm the last person in line to judge someone for wanting to cash in, but it is a little annoying when people cash in while acting like they're not doing it and are just making enough to survive. In reality, Boogie himself admitted that he made six figures yearly in his upper middle class, so at the time he definitely wasn't in line to get a job at Target anytime soon. But what really does it is the fact that he bought the same overpriced shit box that every mouth breather online influencer also buys, a Tesla. Yes, the madman actually did it. To make matters worse, he excused his decision to do so by saying that, despite AdSense paying him poorly, which he's probably lying about, his sponsors pay well and he can easily afford a Tesla. A week later, however, he was back to portraying his impoverished persona, acting like he bought a car he couldn't afford and regretted it. Later on, when people started throwing this at him when he tried to play poor again, he would simply pretend like he never said he bought it. Can you believe the gall you need to have to do that when you know people can print the things you say online and keep track? of them. Yet another topic he's blatantly and consistently lied about is his weight. For example, during a 30-day clean eating challenge he did to lose weight, about halfway into it, he's seen eating fried foods and candy. In a stream clip, he claims this is due to the fact in the event he was attending, no healthy food was available, which most certainly was a lie. Seriously, in the late 2010s with insane amounts of money and a phone with internet connection, you can't figure out how to get yourself food that isn't sugar-coated or deep-fried. And if there really is nothing else, you can just eat after or leave and come back. In late 2018, he posted an image of his scale showing that he was at 350 pounds. Then in January of 2019, he claimed that he's now hitting 350 and this is somehow an improvement. Either he somehow faked the scale's numbers in 2018, or he's lying to his audience in January, acting like he's still improving and losing weight. Keep in mind at this point, his YouTube earnings already paid for a weight loss surgery and his fans are cheering him on the whole time. Why even announce this weight loss journey if you're not going to follow through or even attempt? What's noticeable is that he could just keep these things private. He never even had to announce his weight loss journey. And Instead, he deliberately made it public for everyone to see, only to lie about it for what seems like no reason. In countless different instances, he can be seen drinking things like milkshakes and sodas despite having sworn these things off. While he occasionally admits that he outright failed to eat like he was supposed to in order to lose weight, he also often says that eating less makes him literally suicidal and he has no intention of actually diminishing it to any significant degree. In between the multiple glasses of soda per meal, pizzas, and cookies, it's evident that Boogie doesn't care as much about fixing his diet as he pretends to for inspirational videos on YouTube. A fitness YouTuber even tried to help him lose weight, only for Boogie to make snide comments on Reddit about how he's only after his clout and money, with more excuses about how being 350 pounds is where he's comfortable at and statistically where he's meant to be, whatever that's supposed to mean. Uh, and I have authenticate, authenticated it, so I'm going to read from it and it goes like this. So a ton of people link me to the video created by Everyday Day Fitness. I'll even link it here. Much appreciated, Boogie. Videos like this are not helpful, they are harmful. In a clip from a later stream, he outright tells the people concerned about his weight to go fuck themselves, and that since it's his body, it's his business, as if he hasn't made project upon project and pity post upon pity post, trying to get some community support for his weight loss plight, only to completely dump it and act like he never wanted to do it in the first place. It's one thing to struggle with weight issues, but Boogie struggles with treating the stragglers who, for whatever miraculous reason, still give him attention and money in pursuit of his weight loss.
In December of 2019, Boogie began making a number of accusations about a subreddit to people via Twitter DMs, painting them as squatters and dangerous people who are trying to destroy his livelihood and physically harm him. He said, Get away from that hive mind. They are sad, scary, dangerous people. They have swatted me, attempted to destroy my livelihood. They bombard my fans and sponsors with hatred. They have done awful, terrible things. They lie to you and tell you that they want the best, but then do the worst. If they wanted the best, they'd leave me alone. Trust me. I've been swatted twice this month already. They let her bomb two sponsors already. They contacted a friend of mine on Facebook and tried to convince her to stop being my friend because she was a female and I am a rapist. With tales that tall and claims that dramatic, it piqued people's interest. After all, Boogie already had a reputation for exaggerating things at this point. The subreddit in question was r slash Sam and Tolkien, regarded today by many Redditors as an invaluable archive for all sorts of shady sh various e celebs have gotten up to over the years. The sub acted as a sort of Kiwi Farms on Reddit, documenting internet drama for all. One of the site's biggest threads was the Boogie criticism mega thread titled the hidden truth boogie doesn't want you to know within this thread they detailed his strange blogs we read earlier interactions with his ex-wife his alleged sugar babies lucy fox and the grave ghoul and many other accusations they point out his association with kid behind a camera who this thread calls a known child abuser Boogie2988 just gave the least hard-hitting interview I've ever seen in my life. He glossed over abuse, allowed Michael, aka Kid Behind a Camera, to make excuses for himself and deflect from the questions that were being asked of him, and even coach Michael into making himself look like a better person. Now, to keep things fair, this entire thread does frame some lesser or honestly negligible defenses in the worst light possible. That being said, I think the key takeaway from this is that regardless of the less hard-hitting criticisms, the Boogie on YouTube was hardly in line with the boogie portrayed in that thread. He was a completely different person away from the camera. It wasn't even close to who he let on he was in his 10 minute rants. But regardless of that criticism, Boogie was now claiming that his subreddit and its users had swatted him, not once, but twice in one month. Curious as to the validity of these claims, one of the people who runs the subreddit by the name of Haberdasher A went through all of the moderation logs for the month of December to see if he could find any evidence of the claims that this subreddit was involved, but to no avail. When he asked for any evidence of Boogie's claims of swatting, his story did what it always does when pressed for veracity. It started to change, with him now claiming he didn't know who in particular had swatted him, while still insisting that it did happen. Obviously, I have no idea of knowing who swatted me and never said I did, just said I got swatted twice last month. Once when I was away at the Game Awards, and another over Christmas break. This is true. Two times, cops came out with a partner and an ambulance. Seeing as Steven has still failed to provide any actual evidence for the things he was saying, Haberdasher decided to look into Boogie's local police station's publicly available logs to see if they'd ever been to his house. Fayetteville Police Department's public dispatch logs showed that no officers were sent to Boogie's place of residence in the entire month of December. When they confronted Stephen with this information, he claimed that he had made an arrangement with the Fayetteville Police Department to purge the dispatch records after a welfare check in July of 2019. I think it should be clear to anyone with half a brain that this was another lie and that Stephen is just shooting himself in the foot trying to cover up a lie with another lie. And if that wasn't enough, the Fayetteville Police had dispatch logs of a welfare check in November 2019, nearly four months months after Boogie had claimed that they stopped keeping records of welfare checks on him. When he was informed of this, Boogie responded by saying that the police had made a mistake and that he didn't know why there would be a record. It should be noted that the state where Boogie lives, Arkansas, has state law that requires that records be kept of all dispatches, so even if he tried to get such an arrangement with the police, he wouldn't be able to. It's against the law. Did Boogie2988 get the governor's permission? When asked via email, Fayetteville police stated that under no circumstances would they not have a dispatch record of a visit to someone's residence. For Boogie to not be lying about the users of the subreddit in this situation, the only possible explanation is that the police station doesn't follow the law about police dispatches, lies via emails, and has a secret deal with Boogie to not make record of welfare checks to his house so that internet trolls will not be able to bother him on Twitter anymore. Not only that, but Boogie, in all of his infinite wisdom, would have to leak the news of this secret deal with the police in which he would be implicating himself in order to prove that he was telling the truth. You see how these things don't quite add up? And it's such an idiotic thing to lie about. Once again, he made completely unnecessary claims that he did not need to when he could have just ignored the sub altogether. But I guess the craving to make yourself out to be a victim is too hard to resist. After being caught with this mountain of evidence against him that pretty much proved that he had been lying, he finally admitted to lying about the whole thing. But of course, he couldn't do it the right way and be honest that he had been, you know, lying. Because if he did that, then he has to admit that he did something wrong. And not in a disingenuous way, in a way that would show some actual humility 
humility and maturity. You know, basic human being things. Instead, his statement was that all of this had been part of an elaborate master plan to bait his critics into thinking that he was lying and go after him. He claims that he intentionally falsely accused his critics and his local police department of committing a federal crime for fun. Let's see what the master manipulator wannabe had to say. So I always have a bunch of people tweeting at me for attention ever since I talked to one critic this summer. So I took advantage of that and slipped into DMs a few weeks back and filled one guy with misinformation I knew he would leak mixed with the truth. I'm a terrible liar and reading it back is so cringe. Claimed I dated a 43 year old woman for almost a year. Said I was writing a book, half true, and all kinds of other stuff. Was hoping it would keep them busy. It sure did. It was like they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. One of the things I said was that I got two visits from the cops in December. Now that's not so much of a lie because I got maybe four visits last year. I just shifted the dates around. Had no clue they would latch onto that one like they did though. To prove me wrong, they literally looked up my home address then cross-referenced it via police records to try to discredit me. But in the process, actually proved I got swatted three times last year, providing the dates making it easier to find my address. By the way, I mean they literally violated Reddit policy by making it easy on a thread to find my home address. It could even get their subreddit shut down. Absolutely insane. What's even crazier is that they tried to make it seem like I blamed them for the SWAT. I didn't. This was of course horribly manipulative and something I would normally never do. I have a friend in PR and she recommended giving the misinformation and I figure I have nothing to lose at this point so why not have fun with it. But wow, did they take the bait. I'm sorry if this disappoints you, but after years of being harassed by these people, I just wanted to take some control back. I just can't believe how awful it made them look. Doxing me, then spending hours going through police records to discredit me. Horrible obsession gone awry. I feel really dirty and awful. I don't like lying and I don't like manipulating though, but I figure if they were going to call me that, I may as well take that and use it against them. Nothing in the world more dangerous than someone who has nothing left to lose though. I recommend watching out. It's textbook misdirection. You see, if you try to do due diligence on the lies he spins, you're actually the weirdo for being obsessed. When this was pointed out as extremely reckless and irresponsible behavior, he DM'd someone on Twitter saying he wasn't afraid of potential jail time for pulling the prank he did. In response to backlash from even his own fans on YouTube, Boogie stated that he was glad he lied about swatting and is willing to keep doing it if it makes his critics look bad. If it hasn't become clear to you already, allow me to spell it out to you. Though he might not have the most malicious of intentions, he is clearly very unstable and unfit to be on the internet, as it seems to exacerbate every problem he has. I know it's technically his job, but if the way that he responds to criticism is by lying to such an extent that it ventures into the realm of criminality that could land him in actual jail, I think it's better for him to miss out on whatever money he could make on AdSense by staying online in order to preserve his liberties. However hard to believe, considering how insane things already are, there's even more to this story. Not even a day after he tried to pretend that he was on some kind of elaborate operation to troll the trolls, Boogie's Twitter profile name was changed to period. Meanwhile, his profile and banner pictures were removed. Shortly after the bizarre profile change, Boogie posted to his TikTok to say that his Twitter had been hacked by that hate subreddit. Now, obviously, it's rather suspicious that a hacker would get into Boogie's account, presumably where there's a lot of information stored in Twitter DMs, and then proceed to do nothing other than delete a few tweets and leave his account alone. Especially given his previous day of lying for hours on end to save face, most people on the sub and even in his general Twitter following were skeptical of the story. One person on Twitter took him to task on it. Why did they leave the channel link, stream promotion, and literally everything else? How isn't your Gmail compromised? Dude, just stop. To which Boogie replied, If I was faking this, I would have absolutely deleted those things. If I was faking, I would have left a breadcrumb trail to Kiwi Farms or elsewhere. But they want to frame me as a liar, and you took the bait. Basically, he immediately gets defensive and tries to act as if it's somehow obvious that the supposed hacking couldn't have been his work. Of course, he doesn't provide any proof that he was hacked. He just goes around Twitter getting into petty slap fights with random strangers about how he's definitely not lying. A day later, Boogie claimed that he got his account back and made a tweet claiming that the hacker used the streaming app Mob Crush to hack into his Twitter account. He also posted the IP address of all the recent logins in order to prove that he had been hacked from the app. Mob Crush then made an official statement on Twitter stating that it was impossible for a hacker to gain access to a user's Twitter account in the manner Boogie was describing and that the IP Boogie had posted was from their own AWS servers, showing that Boogie had indeed lied about being hacked. In typical Boogie fashion, he claimed that the people on the subreddit were lying and that he indeed had been hacked, but that he could not actually prove his own statements and all evidence pointed to him being wrong. Came back to Twitter for one thing 
thing. Why would I fake a hack to remove those tweets if I was making a video admitting to the thing I deleted? Still no clue how I got hacked, but use your brain. It's pointless to hide a tweet about something that I'm uploading in 24 hours. I mean, he's right. It would be extremely dumb to fake a hack to remove those tweets about something that you're posting within a day. If you really want to talk about what's the most probable explanation to this incident, it's much, much more likely that Boogie faked the hack in order to have something to make the subreddit that has been outing you as a pathological lying freak look bad. There's something called qui bono, which is the principle that in order for a conspiracy to happen, there must also be someone benefiting from it. Look at who may benefit, and you probably have your culprit. The only person that could possibly benefit from this harmless hack was Boogie himself, since it would only make the subreddit look bad. If there was any compromising information about him that got leaked, then that would cast doubt on it being Boogie at all, because why would he leak that, right? But if there's no compromising information, it's just a hack, the only evidence doesn't seem to add up, and the only account of it is coming from Boogie, well, you can probably guess where it came from. To top this all off, he made a video called Boogie2988 Exposed, where he claims he's working with the FBI to stop the harassment campaign on him. When people started laughing at this attempt at intimidation and mass, he deleted the video, but luckily for us, it has been re-uploaded. These lies being exposed also called upon another situation that, at the time, nobody had thought to question. In June of 2017, Boogie appeared on the H3 podcast. There, he told a story about how someone on the deep web, in his words, put out a Bitcoin offer to have him assassinated. The address that gets leaked the first time, they eventually get my address right, but the address that gets leaked the first time Wasn't is my, my neighbor's address, yeah. my friend's address. Uh -huh. And so when they put the uh, assassination hit on Tor Network, they sent it to my house. Then to show, like they sent an email to me, hey man, you need to see this. Given everything we've seen so far, I'd say that's a likely story. It was at this point Boogie got himself into a situation he never expected, and one that gave him the opportunity to be the victim he desperately desired to be seen as. In the middle of 2020, YouTuber Frank Hassel began interacting with Boogie's account online, mocking him for having blocked him and generally being a nuisance towards him. At the time, it seemed like Boogie had no idea who Frank even was. Eventually, this pressure on Steven mounted to the point where he and Frank went at it on the kill stream, which resulted in an extremely one-sided battering on Boogie's pathological lying. In what looks like a desperate attempt to get Frank to relent from attacking him, Boogie DMs Frank saying that he's welcome to kill him as long as Frank doesn't hurt his family, friends, and dog. Frank's trolling campaign on Boogie only became more extreme as time went on, with him posting a picture of himself in front of Boogie's house saying, this is my house now. Boogie calls his bluff, saying that he won't show up because he's a coward, while simultaneously suggesting that he shouldn't show up because he would be shot. Eventually, as most of you probably already know, if you have even a cursory amount of knowledge about Boogie or Frank, eventually this confrontation took place in real life. Frank showed up to Boogie's doorstep with a GoPro strapped to his forehead, insulting Boogie in whatever ways he could think of, and Boogie came out with a revolver. After a couple of minutes of them going back and forth, Boogie shot a warning shot, and Frank left. Though thankfully both parties came out unharmed, Boogie shot a gun in a school zone, which landed him in county jail, which he was bailed out of at the tune of $5,000. When it comes to assessing what happened here morally, there's a strong case to be made that Boogie was unjustly harassed in the situation. But for most people, the ends justified the means because the entire thing was just too funny to ignore. This whole situation made Boogie back away from social media, but this was only temporary, as in June of 2021, he returned with a video about his arrest. Despite everything that had happened, from being arrested, charged for his reckless shooting of a firearm into the air, and the amount of people making fun of him, Boogie had finally managed to recapture some semblance of relevance. This video has more than 600,000 views, which is the best he had done in a while. And for once, he was a genuine victim. He didn't have to lie. He had something real to complain about. This was a make or break moment for Boogie. He was being talked about by Scarce, Drama Alert, and every internet news outlet under the sun. He could either spin this story into another wave of popularity by making some genuinely great content now that he had all eyes on him, or repeat the mistakes of his past and once again fade into irrelevance. As you can probably guess, we didn't get the good ending. For the past half decade, Boogie has had a pretty dedicated group of observers going over all of his controversies and compiling information about him. Apart from Sam and Tolkien, which was banned, many of these guys congregate on the typical lolcow sites. After the subreddit that talked about Boogie was shut down, the discussions were relegated either to lolcow itself, which was far from being as easy to access and normie friendly as Reddit and Kiwi Farms. A lot of people treat the farms like they treat 4chan, as an evil boogeyman that does nothing but harm. PR-wise, Boogie had it easy, as his most first 
fervent opponents started out with the massive disadvantage of being known as the gathering spot for the scum of the earth. Much like 4chan, for every good and informative post that's backed up by evidence and well-done research, there's three or more posts spewing absolute nonsense. But if you're in the business of researching eccentric, esoteric, and otherwise extraordinarily screwed people, as I am, you're condemned to sit through it with the patience of a Buddhist monk. As it turns out, the boogie thread on Kiwi Farms is gigantic, with over 1,200 pages of nothing but people dunking on the guy. Personally, despite all I've covered, I don't hate him as much as I feel pity and annoyance, but that's besides the point. More recently, a development from the site has been the idea that Boogie is currently running sock accounts to get back at his haters. It all started with Boogie Truth, a Twitter account that has collected content that criticizes Boogie for quite some time. As you can see, it's relatively small and doesn't get a ton of engagement, getting 20 likes on a tweet on a good day. Enter this post on Kiwi, where someone is remarking that this account, Nightly Girl 4, is responding to the Boogie Truth account saying, well, maybe if it weren't for the hate sites and stalkers, he wouldn't have to worry about staying off social media. We also have a reply to Shoe on Head saying, that. Now, if we go to Twitter to take a look at this account, we can see that the only thing they do for the most part is interact with Boogie. They retweet all of his stuff, they compliment him, they insult anyone who is critical of him, and they have a particular hatred for Frank Hassel, who at this point was seen as Boogie's arch nemesis. They tweeted H3, trying to get Ethan's attention to talk about Boogie, and they weirdly insult Boogie's dad and call him a rapist. This is quite unusual, since people were already heavily doubtful of Boogie's stories about his CSA, to the point where the thought of anyone calling him a rapist based on the things Boogie has said was far-fetched. When taking a look at the bio for this account, we see she describes herself as a cute goth girl just living her life. Now, if we look at Google Images and simply type in cute goth girl, this is one of the first results, so this obviously isn't her. Whoever made this account just ripped it and used it as a profile picture, but that's not abnormal, right? A lot of people use pics that don't belong to them or pics of other people as their profile images. But let's be honest here for a second, what person self-identifying as a cute goth girl would be a fan of Boogie2988 of all people? And not just a fan, mind you, an obsessive fan who does nothing but talk to and about Boogie all day. Sure, anyone can make a Twitter account and claim to be whoever, so it might be some anon that's a Boogie fan pretending to be a cute goth girl. However, who has the motivation to be a steadfast defender of Boogie in modern day besides Boogie himself? This incongruence was accentuated when another similar account began popping up, this one called a Busty Girl 69 This account was suspended, but from a screenshot we can see that it was made the same month as the other account, with the same super basic bio scheme as well as a picture of some random chick from Google Images with a flag for a banner. One noteworthy interaction from this person was that when someone messaged them, being admittedly pretty mean, they took it very personally, sending back an image of Goatsy accompanied by the following message. Fuck you piece of shit, scrotal faced hate stalker. Fuck you, Kiwi Farms. Fuck Frank. You guys cause me more stress and I hope you die. Get blocked. This sounds quite like a certain YouTuber we've come to know and despise. It almost reads like breaking character clear as day. Not only because the reaction was so angry, but also because Frank and Kiwi Farms are explicitly singled out, which just reeks of Boogie being extremely salty about having his good guy persona picked apart so brutally by them. Another account, this one called Nocturnal Walrus, was created a month apart from the other two, also following the same format, with a typical praise for Boogie and fixation on his haters. Someone did the diligence of comparing the times of interaction on the Nocturnal Walrus account, and we see that on April 29th, Boogie's first tweet of the day was at 4.24pm. Coincidentally, the first tweet of the day on the Nocturnal Walrus account was just a few minutes later. Boogie also went out of his way to respond to them specifically. Now, it's worth noting that the account posting this then goes on to call Boogie a morbidly obese pedo, only half of which is true, but the screenshots are certainly compelling. This is followed up with a more compelling post comparing the dates, and we see that this is a trend for this account. They always respond to Boogie, they only respond to Boogie, and the times always line up. The more people looked into these patterns, the more similar accounts turned up. Eventually, word of this made its way around Twitter until it found its way back to Boogie, who decided to respond with his usual spiel, claiming that people will believe anything anyone says about him and claiming it's ridiculous to think he would ever pull such a thing, when he obviously would pull such a thing given his track record. People out here believe that anyone who says something positive about me is just me on another account. Prove them wrong and say something nice. This is yet another example of Boogie's not-so-competent attempts at doublespeak. Here, while he does imply that the account is not his, he doesn't actually claim it. Instead, he suggests that people begin saying positive things about him to prove that he isn't the only person who could say good things about himself. 
Clearly, he's begging for some kind of validation from fans, who now were more scattered than ever since the guy they were a fan of was self-destructing in front of his own audience. Some people bought this defense from him, but I have to say that, if you did, then you either don't know much about Boogie or you're desperate to believe in this nice guy narrative. All in all, for whatever qualities he may have, Boogie is severely terminally online and has been for way too long, which is bad enough if you have no mental issues. He's been known to lie very flagrantly for weeks on end to make himself look like a victim in situations, and I honestly believe that he's the one running these sock accounts. It's either that, or someone is trying to frame him by making the accounts, but at this rate, we have a Boy Who Cried Wolf situation where, even if Boogie isn't the one pulling the strings this time, his rep is so bad that it will never be figured out. Even if he has lied in the past, I don't think he would accept defeat this quickly. It doesn't really make sense to me. Furthermore, Boogie specifically sought out the replies of this account to respond to this person, accusing the account of being an alt rather than address it publicly. You would think that with all the hate he gets, he would be able to just ignore it, but he has consistently shown himself completely unable to let go. Time and time again, he compulsively has to go through the replies, expose himself to all the vitriol, and engage with it. I mean, even if there was a troll doing this, they would have to be the least intelligent troll ever. What is the point in pretending that Boogie runs alts to respond to people? What actual damage would that even do when you compare it to the massive list of other lies he's told? This pales in comparison to the swatting. But the overarching truth of the matter is, it actually doesn't matter at all to anyone whether the alts are his or not. Well, to anyone except Steven. He needs everybody to know that, in his free time, he's definitely not making fake accounts to pretend that he has dedicated fans, who all happen to be super hot cutie 3.14s, by the way. One of the most revisited parts of Boogie's backstory is the fact that poverty is something that looms in his background. From growing up dirt poor, to living in his brother's apartment in his early adulthood, to being on disability for a total of three years from age 34 to 37, Boogie has always had issues with money. After he began making some off of YouTube, this issue was soothed to a great extent, but as it turns out, the problem isn't just with money itself, but with the mentality he has when it comes to finance. In 2017, about a decade into his YouTube career, Boogie took an interest in cryptocurrency that January, Bitcoin's value broke the $1,000 barrier. It then doubled, tripled, and by the end of the year, skyrocketed to over 19 grand. This immense growth led many people to become millionaires overnight. That included some YouTubers, of whom Boogie became quite envious of. He tweeted out, Remember when Bitcoin was 800 bucks? I had 10k in savings at that time and didn't invest because I didn't believe it would increase in value. That would have sold for over $200,000 today. I hate myself. He then lamented that he'll never be a millionaire now, which is probably only only true if he's talking about liquidity because if we're to consider his house part of his net worth, he's most definitely a millionaire already. Many were quick to point out that his hesitancy to invest was a good thing as you shouldn't invest more than you're willing to lose. To Boogie, however, all he saw was that other people got something that he didn't, and he was unwilling to hear a second opinion. Though no one can know for sure, it's perhaps that goal that led him to treat these investments as tools for gambling. After seeing how much he could have made on Bitcoin, Boogie bought a small amount of Ethereum at a friend's recommendation. They told him it was projected to grow 10 times in value. It was priced at $120 at the time, which places his purchase in May of 2017. Ethereum grew throughout the year, reaching over 1000 by January 2018. This meant Boogie made eight times his initial investment, a massive relief during an otherwise stressful point in time. You see, just weeks prior was when his then-wife filed her divorce. Though Boogie got to keep the house and car, she was given half their savings. While this still left him with more money than what a lot of people see in their lifetime, it pushed him into a midlife crisis. He claimed that during their marriage, he spent next to nothing, which, again, I'd safely venture to say is some major cap. Because of this, he attempted to recapture his youth by indulging in toys. He then refurnished the house, spending thousands on new furniture. And as previously mentioned, Boogie created an account on a sugar baby website to find some poor girl he could spend extravagant amounts of cash on. There, he listed his net worth at half a million dollars and an annual income of 150000 He later claims that this helped him cope and dull the feelings of loneliness. Unfortunately, this prosperity came to an end when crypto began to plummet. Bitcoin dipped as low as $3,000, with other currencies faring far worse. Ethereum's fall was one of the most drastic, losing 94% of its value over the year. Once again, Boogie kicked himself for not trusting his gut. I thought about selling off my initial investment in crypto when Ethereum was worth $1,500. Now it's worth $500 and falling. Easy come, easy go, I guess. I've lost so much in Ethereum this month that if I lost every dime of this, I wouldn't even notice. It's important to remember that back then, crypto was just something he toyed around with, as Boogie had far 
more lucrative revenue streams. In 2013, he claimed he was making $25,000 a year on YouTube alone. This amount obviously went up as he became more popular, but it was eventually threatened during the adpocalypse of the late 2010s, in which advertisers became more strict in what they were willing to support. His main channel was caught in the crossfire, being blacklisted for many ads. Thanks to his positive reputation, however, he wasn't affected as heavily as others. He was able to recoup a significant amount through merch sales and sponsorships, which by 2019 he claimed made up 90% of his income. He made so much, in fact, that it was during this time that the Tesla debacle happened, with him claiming he put a down payment on one. Had he maintained this, Boogie would likely still be fine today in spite of his woes. But in the background, a controversy began to erupt. As previously mentioned, after his divorce, glimpses of his manipulative and malicious behavior began to become more and more apparent. This left many fans disillusioned with Boogie and his content, especially after Lucy Fox's video on him. So they began digging, uncovering a long history of bizarre statements and inconsistencies. By the time Sam and Tolkien got to him, there was a decent case to be made that he was a pathological liar, among a host of other terrible traits. This erupted in February 2019 when the mega thread was made. This was then adapted into a YouTube video by Christopher Tom, which has nearly 4 million views. The deconstruction of his persona and subsequent backlash kneecapped his career. Consequently, there was an immense pressure on sponsors to distance themselves from him. By mid-2020, Boogie claims that his 4 million sub channel was generating little to no income. I'm making a few bucks, not enough to call it a living. My Patreon only brings in 130 bucks a month because I never promote it. I make maybe a few hundred a month from donations as I never stream. AdSense is mostly non-existent now. Sponsors are rare. Thankfully, there was one last refuge for Boogie, the Ethereum from all those years back that he never sold. For years, he continued to hold out hope that one day, it'd go straight to the moon. Because he publicly mourned his losses a year prior, to say people were skeptical is an understatement. They restlessly waited for the day that he lost it all, and in every other aspect of his life, that year was soul-crushing. In addition to losing his main source of income, he got into his very public feud with Frank Hassel, which ended in Boogie firing a quote-unquote warning shot that resulted in his arrest. Now, in addition to his already fleeting income, he had to hire an attorney, being forced to spend over $30,000 on trying to keep himself out of jail. But perhaps, as a rare moment of divine intervention, Boogie hit the crypto jackpot. In March of 2020, Ethereum was priced at approximately $130. It appreciated slowly until October when the value increased rapidly. By January, it was worth over $1,200, and three months later, that doubled. This growth continued until November, with the currency peaking at nearly $4,500. Boogie was undoubtedly rolling it at this point. But, like in many other instances, this second chance quickly began being abused. Boogie started bragging shortly after the first thousand. He wasted no time rubbing it in the faces of the Redditors, saying, Whenever the market does well, I think back to an old Reddit post earlier this year during the crash that said, thank God Boogie's losing all his money. How spiteful this person must have been that he hoped millions of people would go broke so I could lose my meager savings. He then announced he'd be quitting YouTube as he no longer needed a job. This is because he invested far more in crypto than he let on. In the summer of 2019, Boogie was very openly suicidal. He even threatened to take his own life at VidCon, forcing several YouTubers to intervene. It was this unwillingness to live that led him to contemplate. He claims that if he was going to die anyway, he may as well gamble away his savings. So, at the supervision of Jesse from McJugger Nuggets, he put all of his life savings into crypto. This would all be revealed in a video he uploaded on January 18th titled, I'm Finally Rich, How Crypto Made Me Rich. While Boogie doesn't state exactly how much he made, he stipulates that it wasn't even close to a million. But as Ethereum continued to rise, that attitude changed. Just over a week later, he would tweet out, So, remember I made that video saying I was rich, meaning I'm stable and well off? If crypto keeps doing this, I'll actually be a millionaire for the first time in my life. I did the calculations and if I was able to cash out right around 1 million, I could retire. Never worry about money again. Travel the world, get surgery to remove this skin, take care of my friends, also hookers and cocaine, I guess. In true boogie fashion, he continued bragging while feigning humility. In one tweet, he claimed to feel guilty for making so much money because he couldn't share it, but it's obvious he just wanted to flaunt his newfound wealth as he fixated on the mythical seven figures. He would tweet over and over again about how he hoped to become a millionaire. Thank God I invested and got lucky. Not a millionaire yet, maybe one day. After my crypto passes one million, I'll get the Model X and make it a back to the future car. When my crypto investments finally make me a millionaire, I'm going to have hot nurses give me my Mountain Dew intravenously. This is no coincidence. Even before investing, it's an aspiration he'd tweet about often. In October 2016, shortly before his ads were undercut, he wanted to earn a million within three years. Weeks later, that goal changed to one year. Of course, once he lost both his ads and sponsors, this became infeasible. That is, until crypto offered him one final chance, and by late February, Boogie tripled his life savings. This was well more than enough for him to live comfortably, and given he admitted it was the gamble of a suicidal man, one would expect him to withdraw. But oddly, he seemed convinced it was safer in Ethereum. He spoke of it as if it were a bank, 
noting that his money was better there and out of their reach. Instead of pulling it out, he attempted to diversify by taking more and more risks on random shit coins with basically no backing. Though it's uncertain how many he bought, some can be ascertained through Twitter. Not only was Boogie being greedy, he was also exhibiting signs of pride, as he began investing as if he actually had a good understanding of what made certain cryptos valuable and others not, instead of investing with the understanding that he had gotten lucky. For example, Boogie bought a few hundred dollars worth of Luna. This would end up being a 99.9% .9 loss, dropping to just two cents. Even when he did make money, the gains were then funneled into losses. He put three grand into Dogecoin of all things, only to profit 2,000. However, the money was then put into GME during the GameStop short squeeze. Despite claiming multiple times he would walk away from crypto for security, he never did. Instead, he wasted away hundreds of thousands of dollars in a desperate attempt to earn more. By the end of the year, he became much quieter about his investments, and it would take until 2022 for him to admit why. On February 23rd, he admitted to making so many bad trades, he was back to a break-even investment point. Within 12 months, he managed to lose half a million dollars. This itself would be bad enough, but just a few months later, even that would be lost. That same June, the crypto market experienced a massive downturn. This resulted in it shedding nearly 60% of its total market cap, a loss of over $2 trillion. This universal decline caused Boogie to incur a loss of over six figures. How's the crypto crash hitting you? Not great. <laughs> I will take your subscriptions today. <laughs> uh, uh, I will definitely take your donations and subscriptions today. Crypto market crashes is not fun. I am sweating it. I'm sweating bullets, boys. You remember this time a year ago, I made a video saying I'll never have to work again and I'm fine and everything else. Should have pulled out of the market then. I <laughs> did not. <laughs> I mean, I think it's going to go back up at one point, but, uh, you know, for it is right now, scary times, boys. Ethereum alone decreased to a third of its price, dropping from 3000 bucks to just 1000 in a few months. Boogie remained hopeful, desperate to retain that illusion that he was still wealthy. But as what remained of his savings began to dry up, he was forced to accept the truth. Up until this point, no one knew how truly bad things had gotten. But then on October 5th, Boogie uploaded a video simply titled, I Need Your Help. The bad reason is I'm finally in a position where I have to get back to work. And I'm not making any excuses here. You know I spent a tremendous amount of money on dumb, dumb things. But the biggest issue is that I had a nice big nest egg. I took some financial advice from a friend and I'm not pointing fingers necessarily. I took the advice, but I put my money in the crypto market in the wrong section and I pretty much lost most of everything. After publicly gloating that YouTube was no longer his job, Boogie begrudgingly returned. He briefly explains what happened, blaming advice he took from a friend. The rest is exactly what you would expect. He desperately begs his audience for money while promising new Francis videos. He calls upon them to buy his merchandise, use his referral links, and send super chats. Of course, this was rather unconvincing and the video was received extremely poorly, receiving an overwhelming 18,000 dislikes compared to 10,000 likes. The comments were filled with people mocking him and telling him to get a job. In response, he reminded them that he was disabled and a felon. For unrelated reasons, here's a clip from March of this year before the crash. And when people tell me to go get a real job, it makes me laugh because I'm not gonna go work harder to make less money. That might be your choice. It definitely ain't gonna be mine. Though Boogie doesn't name whose advice he took, he would provide more clues on Twitter. In March, Boogie tweeted about STORJ. He stated that experts consider the coin undervalued and worth looking into. The price plummeted, causing many to criticize him for giving bad financial advice. In response, he claimed to have not lost much and that anyone who thought otherwise was a moron. Well, after uploading the video, he wrote a thread admitting that he did, in fact, lose a lot on it. 100% this. I took bad financial advice from a friend who promised he would bail me out if things went bad. Things went bad and he did not. Really stupid of me. Please tell us the shitcoin. You're gonna laugh. Storage. This alludes to the same offer explicitly referenced to be from McJugger Nuggets. Interestingly, Boogie claims to have severed the friendship in a reply. In a different thread, he states that he hasn't spoken to Jesse in eight months. It seems like after realizing how much he'd lost, Boogie attempted to take him up on the deal. It wasn't honored and the two had a falling out. The same day this video came out, Jesse was called out by an ex-friend for allegedly misgendering her on purpose. This led to a massive back and forth as Boogie stepped to her defense. He would even film a statement for the Keemstar show where a three hour breakdown of the drama was conducted. I just wanted to film a little video here in support of Emily because I feel like it's really important that her message is heard here. 
Jesse responded by accusing him of ulterior motives, claiming he weaponized the issue for his personal problems. Find a camera with the fake tears and boogie, and everyone's trying to put their bitter resentment, their personal problems towards me, and weaponize it with this whole transgender shit. Jesse, you're trying to you know, manipulate everybody, because that's all you fucking do. He elaborated in a Twitter video the next day, though surprisingly revealed an entirely different reason. In Jesse's words, they fell out because one of Boogie's friends brought two prostitutes to his Halloween party without permission. Apparently, they drunkenly started fingering each other to the point of staining his carpet with blood. Jesse's father kicked them out, only for the friend to drunkenly put him through a table. Boogie was allegedly filming all of this, which led Jesse's dad to lecture him on being disrespectful. They got into an argument, resulting in Boogie and his friend being kicked out and forced to stay at a hotel. Boogie refuted this by posting a video of these ladies of the night making out, but it's since been deleted. It did show he wasn't filming in the specific clip, but other than that, the circumstances remain unclear. It seems strange that if Jesse was responsible for the advice, it wouldn't come up. Boogie is dead set on blaming that friend for his current situation, stating, I wasn't living beyond my means. I just rested it all on the advice of a friend and it didn't pan out. What can I say? I'm an idiot. Boogie would manage to collect nearly a thousand in donations. Not a lot, but more than you'd expect. He also made hundreds by signing and selling Magic the Gathering cards. On YouTube, it appears he's begun to embrace whatever tactics are necessary to get clicks. He released a follow-up video thanking supporters while reading nice and mean comments. The thumbnail, meanwhile, contains an edited photo of his face to make him appear wider. This is an explicit attempt to monetize hate clicks, showing just how far he's fallen from being the most wholesome man on the internet. Besides the usual vlogging and the desperate attempts at more Francis videos, he returned to form, making videos about his weight and potential potentially losing it. He even recruited yet another fitness YouTuber to help him out with his umpteenth weight loss journey. I don't want to become cynical about this because, on some level, I think that most people hope he'll become healthy and live the rest of his life in peace. But considering that Boogie seems less interested in peace and more in attention and money, I fear that this guy is just wasting his time. On November 15th, 2022, Boogie uploaded a video titled, I have a rare form of cancer. Unfortunately, it seems like he's not lying at all, especially considering that's what his father passed away from. Though we usually look at online influencers and content creators as sources of entertainment and nothing else, it really does seem like Boogie is staring straight at the potential end of his life in a not-too-distant future, and we get to see just what he does with his last days. By March 1st, he posted a video where he talks about going a month off of his antidepressants, meaning that he is quite literally not taking his meds, and though I can't really say what the effects of doing this were, this kind of screwing around with the medicine you've been prescribed is seriously advised against. It's also worth noting that in this video, you can see him drinking Mountain Dew. He's also posted several videos talking about his experiences with psychedelics since then, saying he's reached multiple revelations about himself as a person and who he is. Whether these various epiphanies will mean anything to his future, I can't say. As much as he's gone through and as intelligent and conscious of his own actions as he may seem, it does look like he's stuck in a cycle of doing bad things, doubling down, pushing everybody away from him, then feeling sorry for himself, rinse and repeat. Despite all of the videos he makes acknowledging how unwell of a person he truly is, none of it is to any avail, as it's just a matter of time until he's back doing his usual stick. It doesn't feel at all like he's trying to change. More so, it seems like he's trying to cash into the credit his audience has extended to him and milk it for everything that it's worth. Even if you can still muster sympathy for him, there's always the fear in the background that as soon as he's given any leeway again, he'll go back to being his normal self. Hopefully I'm wrong. I've been Turkey Tom, thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone.